Hello, my name is Austin Bowser, and welcome back to the Austin B. Media Podcast. Before we get into the main show, I have to tell you how you can support my work. The way I found my work, whether it be a view of a movie I rented or paying for Zoom, my Patreon is the way you can help offset those costs. Patrons like Ambula Bula, Brian Scuttle, David Walters, Joseph Davis of Sip Pop, Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday, Todd Blackburn, and more help make episodes like this possible. So thank you to all of my lovely patrons out there. Beyond financial support, you can get some pretty sweet perks. Whether you're into 40-hour early access to my reviews and this podcast, monthly surveys, giving direct feedback, commentaries, and just about everything in between, consider becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash austinbmedia. You can also save 16% if you decide to subscribe annually. On top of that, if you're not ready to subscribe, you can get a seven-day free trial on every tier I offer. With that said, let's get to the show. Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. Today, I'll be discussing the 2023 edition of the London Film Festival, along with my guest, Latoya Austin, who is a Rotten Tomatoes-approved film reviewer based in London. Uh, She has covered various film festivals, such as Sundance, London Film Festival, Raindance, Toronto International Film Festival, which, coincidentally, I talked to Thomas Stoneham Judge about a few episodes ago. Go check that out. Paris International Film Festival and more. She's also a member of Reclaim the Fame Initiative for Women in Film, participates in French cinema classes, a jury member for the Socially Relevant Film Festival, the Film Filmmakers Film Festival, with Film to Me, right? Film to Me, yes. Yeah, and then she's also a part of the critic groups, uh, the International Cinephile Society, Women Film Critics Circle, and the Online Association for Female Critics, Female Film Critics, and other critics guilds like the International Film Society Critics, or whatever we call it, IFSC. That's how I that's how I remember it. <laughs> yes, IFSC. So acronyms. Yeah. Um. So welcome to the podcast. Uh, tell Thank everyone you about your work. Me. Yeah. No problem. It's great to have you on. Yeah, so thanks for that great introduction. So in terms of my work, I am a film reviewer and as you've mentioned, Rotten Tomatoes approved as well. And so you can find some of my work on my own website, but also other sites as well that I write for, such as Movie Marker, Cinerama Film, uh, Filmotomy from time to time, and then just various other publications as well that may not necessarily be film specific so I do write across a range of publications. As we mentioned we're going to be talking about the 2023 London Film Festival Film Festival but something I've been like that I've been really liking an experiment I do is let me back up okay three two one so we're going to be talking about the 2023 London Film Festival today. And something I've been trying to do is ask guests any, before we get into the discussion, if there's anything, a movie, show, or maybe an al- album from an artist you like that you want to give a shout out to before we get started. Right. So one's from the film festival or just generally? Just in general. I've had people talk about uh, Gen V. I've had people talk about Silver Dollar Road, a documentary that just came out on Prime Video and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. In terms of what I've seen recently, I probably will speak about some from the film festivals, films such as F Mama, which were a first time feature um, by women in film. Yes, quite often I will just advocate those films by women as well. And that one was quite beautifully filmed and poetic. So that was quite good to watch as well. And I just think generally just try to find lots of different films to watch that may not have a distributor as well so it's really quite good for them to have that audience and that feedback and that support so that at least people get to see it at a particular time because you might not see it at any other moment if it doesn't find a sales contact or distributor. Yeah and I think for people who don't know 
dude, maybe just go to the festivals and maybe don't check up on films that don't get sold. It happens way more than you think. Not everyone, every film is a coda that immediately sells off of its Sundance thing. In fact, I think Earth Mama, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it took a while for A24 to pick that up. Yeah, quite possibly. I know that I've seen films that were in non festival that now have a cinema release or others I've watched years ago, where it took them two, three years before there were cinema releases. And I guess those are the fortunate ones. There'll be several that perhaps don't receive those cinema releases, but maybe find their audiences elsewhere. And so I think that is another really key component of film festivals that sometimes we forget about because we all are excited to see the new Scorsese film first and be there to provide our own views about that. And we all want to know about all the latest films that may be popular for award seasons but equally a part of the festival is finding those hidden gems that you might never see at any other time than that screening in that festival and so I think that's a really good time sometimes just to watch something randomly somebody else might just have recommended it and it's word of mouth and so you go to watch it and go in with no expectations whatsoever and that's a lot of the charm about film festivals and particularly ones that champion independent film as well. Yeah, um, I can't recommend that strategy enough where I I talked about this on the TIFF podcast, but I, my film festival strategy is, okay, let's front load everything with, hey, this is the popular stuff. And then, okay, here's the off the wall ones that I'm just really curious about based on their description alone. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And I know because we're seeing press screenings that will dictate um, what it is that we are seeing in terms of our film festival schedules. And so there will be the special presentations, the gala screenings, all of those um, that already have um, a number of renowned actors um, attached to those projects but if you do have those moments to step outside some of those films that are already known from other festivals and delve into the program and find some foreign language films that may be quite unique and ones that are yeah directed by women as well that's a that's another good moment to discover things that may not always hit your tv screens instantly but are just really quite interesting to discover yeah and i think another tip i and i think this will get into something kind of our overall strategies but and then I promise we'll actually talk about the London Film <laughs> Festival, I promise, yes. is when you bring up special presentations, gala screenings. I don't know if I brought this up in the in any other thing I've published online, but if you do go to a special presentation or a gala screening, check that it's not releasing in like the next week or so. I know Tribeca is really bad about, I think Elemental came out a week after Tribeca, so it's more like a bonus Oh, you could see it a week early or you can just wait a week. Um, yes, that, that is a very good tip because we did have Killers of the Flower Moon at the festival and that has just come out in cinemas on Friday. London Film Festival finished like over a week ago. So you do find that. And I don't think there is one document that mentions which films have releases quite soon. So it's sometimes just having to try to do some research if you can. But equally, you still want to see some of those because everyone's going to be talking about them. Yeah, like some examples. I know AFI Fest is, what is that, this week? Is that this week as of recording? I think it's this week. And they have fingernails and the bike riders. And I'm like, okay, see the bike riders because that just got taken off the schedule. Don't see fingernails unless you don't have Apple TV+. 
Yes, I know that's due to come out early November, I believe. Is that the same? November 3rd, I think. Yes. With that said, let's get into the 2023 London Film Festival discussion. Um, first, I want to hear about the films you saw, or even I know some, sometimes they do TV. If you saw TV, that's talk about those as well. That, yeah, what did you see? <laughs> Yes, so I didn't see any TV this time, but yeah. I did watch a wide range of films, so perhaps not as many as some of my peers, but I did manage to watch 26 or 27 films, so not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> what is that average, like four, three or four a day? Yes, I wasn't there um every day during the day so I would be um yes at weekends it was mainly for a day and then evening so it'd be kind of one or two each night and I think I did watch a film for every single day of the festival and then there were also some pre-festival screenings so I caught some films there too but yes it was a Busy time when you do feel as though you're in a bubble, but there's really good camaraderie, even if you're just saying hello to people in the queue each morning and then afterwards discussing some of the films in between queuing for another film. But there's a really good positive vibe generally, and it's a good time to be in London. Yeah, and and I always think whenever I go to a film festival beyond the just networking because there is a ton of networking you could do at these uh, festivals if you haven't gone especially one like london film festival but i also try to maybe find okay what is the clear narrative of this film festival what's the theme of it so did you find a theme for the london film festival i know tribeca was we are all about New York, whether the movie is good or not. And yeah. AFI is just, here's the awards movies. Here's the awards okay. Uh, okay. Uh, no nomination. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah. so I suppose London probably straddles both of those elements. So because it is a film festival that is curated by the British Film Institute, so it is championing British film and independent film. So you will find rare of British films, some maybe debut films, and others by other British directors or first-time directors, as it may be. And then you will also find some films that have already been in the festival circuit, so it might have come from Venice or from TIFF or been at Cannes, you do find a variety of films. So if you do want to perhaps catch films that you've missed at some of the other festivals, uh, as one of the autumn film festivals is a good time to do, but equally if you want to find some films by emerging talent, there's also that opportunity as well. And then we also embrace European cinema so you'll find quite a lot of European films featuring in the festival and then other international films as well so I think there's a good mix I think there's always a good variety there there's also an experimental strand there's a cult strand so I think it covers a lot of genres yeah I think correct me if I'm wrong I think last year was very widespread as well i know was it after sun and all quiet on the western front that premiered there last year yes after sun definitely all quiet on the western front don't recall but yes there were that might have been toronto quite a lot of, there were quite a lot of films there too yeah last year was packed it was absolutely packed and i guess with that, I would like to talk about, you talked about earlier, you talked about seeing, what was it, 26 films? Yes, about that. About that. Uh, so <laughs> Yes, I still have a few more. <laughs> There's also a digital platform that we have access to for a few weeks after the festival as well. Yeah, I'm doing that with uh, New Fest and, oh, the Tallgrass Film Festival. I'm just 
Oh, oh, yeah. So I 100%, I always check the date. Okay, when is the last possible date I can look access <laughs> the, this library? But with that, what of those 26 films either surprised you in how much you liked them or hated them? Okay. I don't think there were any that I particularly hated. Good. There were okay. perhaps... There were perhaps some that I would say didn't resonate with me and others that tested my patience greatly, but I wasn't one of the people that actually walked out of those films. <laughs> so I'd say, yes, there, it was quite a mixed bag, probably, the ones that I saw. So there were some films that were surprise hits for me I went in not knowing what to expect at all and I think that's also a good strategy at times with films in film festivals just to try to avoid reading too many reviews or watching trailers beforehand so that you can be pleasantly surprised and so one of those films was The Holdovers yes the new Alexander Payne film and yes that was that one surprised me. And it's very amusing, but also you have Paul Giamatti there and he's playing this teacher and trying to instill these values. And you have these students who are privileged and entitled and just trying to counter his ever, every move, essentially, until some of them get stuck together over the holiday period. And so, <laughs> but yeah, so it's quite an interesting film but also just really well made and with good dynamics as well so that one was a surprise hit yes that one's good to hear about because I I don't know what it is about that film but I just have alarm bells going off in the back of my mind about that film (laughs) I'm like I don't I don't even know why it's it was one of those ones where I'm like I don't want to see the trailer for this, but but I'm also very anxious. Sorry, dog. But I'm also very anxious about how it'll pull it off. Anyway, with that, continue with your surprises. Yes, so that was a good one. There were others that were highly anticipated and didn't disappoint, such as Poor Things. So with that one, I just say, believe the hype. It is, but it is very well filmed. To me, there are elements of Tim Burton, Guillermo del Toro, lots of these directors that are fantastical, but also have dark comic elements too. I mentioned Emma Stone's performance, also Willem Dafoe and Mark Ruffalo. (laughs) It's also quite good in it too. And it's just one to sit and watch. I think some people may find that, yes, it does have a lengthier runtime, but I think that's just part of its magical journey. And it will surprise as well with some of its scenes and messaging. And it just looks good visually as well. Yeah, I've heard about those scenes because people are starting to talk about the the scenes. but But I won't spoil them. But I'm... With the with that, with poor things, I'm also anxious about that because I liked the lobster, but I didn't like, and I'm talking about Yorgos Lanthimos. He can be hit or miss for me because I love right. the lobster. Didn't like kind of weirded out by killing of a sacred deer because even I tried to watch it three different times and I still don't understand what went on in that movie. <laughs> I still um, haven't seen it. Yeah, maybe you skip that one. And then the favorite, I still haven't finished watching because I was like, I keep turning it off. Uh, right. Because I'm like, oh, this is just not for me. Uh, but w- one day I'll finish that. But Four Things is on my radar. If they, if Searchlight uh, decides to do a press screening near me, I am there. You had me at Emma Stone. Um Yes, I can imagine there will be multiple screenings of that film. So I think I mean, it's certainly garnering a lot of interest. So I think there'll be ample opportunity to watch it. 
and maybe several times as well. Yeah, I'm hoping so. I, I'm not the one that really does the multiple screenings thing where I don't say, hey, can I watch that movie again? <laughs> just yes. in case I didn't get it the first time. I'll At that point, I'll be like, hey, can I get a screener at this point? Because I don't want to drive four hours out of my way. Yes. To- Oh goodness, yes, the distance. Yes, I think for me it really depends. Quite often if I have watched it as an advanced screening, then if friends or family want to watch it, then I might end up watching it again. And then if there are screener links for a home release, then I might also end up watching it again. And sometimes if I am reviewing it and it it has been a while since watching it at a festival before the release date and if perhaps my review is timed for the release date then I might re-watch elements of it just to refresh my memory but I think it's sometimes quite nice to re-watch something when you're not having to review it and you can just sit there and watch it um, yes. and you just see it from a different perspective to the first time when you're trying to pick up as many strands as you can for your review. (laughs) Yeah, because for those who maybe are listening or watching who aren't critics, there's an inherently different way you watch something when you're reviewing it versus just watching it. So like when I was watching Across the Spider-Verse, yes, the analytical parts of my brain are going off because that's just who I am as a person. But when I watch it for review, rather for a podcast discussion that I'm having on the, the week of the 31st, I'm going to be going into that movie with a completely different mindset of, okay, what questions do I want to bring up for the podcast? What, what did I notice the second time around? What did I, stuff like that. And I would have been probably a lot harsher on Top Gun Maverick if I had reviewed it rather than just watched it. <laughs> yes. Because, yeah. But yeah, there's an entirely different mode I don't think people realize you have to go into because you're making mental notes, you're thinking of things that you can put in your review, you're thinking of, oh, what's the hook for my review based on what I'm seeing in front of me? You're just constantly writing the review. Whereas when you're not watching it for a review, you're just like, yeah, sure, fighter jets, cool, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you just sit back and and enjoy it. and don't make any notes or anything like that and just enjoy the atmosphere. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Um, But I think, yes, I think a lot of these films in the festival were also really good to watch with an audience. I didn't just attend the press screenings. I also attended some of the public screenings with the question and answer sessions as well. So those were really good to do. Films such as Saltburn were really good to watch with an audience. And so this is... Emerald Fennell's second film after Promising Young Woman. So this one's set in the UK uh, and starts at quite a traditional institution being Oxford University. And it's it's very riveting and it will probably be divisive. I think there are similarities to films that have already been released that people will discuss so not wanting to spoil anything there and but there and there is a really good performance just from Barry Keane who's incredible in it and I think in this film Rosamund Pike has just missed her ab fab calling She's just just reminds me of like Patsy and some of the others from the series. Absolutely fabulous. And yes, there's just a there's a Britishness about it, but at the same time, I think it will be universal in terms of its themes and it covers a lot of it covers a lot of themes and you have the coming of age aspects, but there's also a lot more to it too. So that one was really good to watch with an audience. Yeah, that's what I miss about watching Promising Young Woman because the first time I watched it was a screener from Film Independent because it got nominated for the Spirit Awards. And I would have done anything to see people's reaction to how that, I won't spoil that movie, 
but <laughs> because I do think it's as re it's recent enough to where I think people have just missed out on the initial wave. But, but yeah, I'm definitely interested to see that. And Barry Keegan, Keegan was probably the best part of Banshees last year. And I think he got paid dust for his supporting role in that. But there was a lot of good movies last year. A lot. But yeah, I'm really interested to see that. Although I don't think I will get used to the name Amazon MGM Studios. It just doesn't sound right to me. I think in time it would just become second nature, as we've seen with so many mergers and takeovers yeah. of the studios and all just joining up and you're just seeing slightly smaller number of them. But I think we'll just become accustomed to seeing those names crop up. Yeah, because like 20th Century Studios, I, I somebody like re-edited the some Star Wars clip or something like that on YouTube or something like that. And they came up with like 20th Century Fox. And I was like, what's 20th oh, Century yes. Fox? And, and I was like, oh, that was the name. That's before. what it used to be. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and it was strange because I knew that like fanfare. But anyways, uh, it's <laughs> interesting how that can come out of your mind. But OK, we've talked about Saltburn. We've talked about the holdovers. What other selections are you really, really interested in? So I also watched The Killer, so oh. David Fincher's film as well. So yes, Michael Fassbender is superb in that. It did strike me as being similar in some aspects to his role in Shame, but actually, because here you have him playing and assassin and it's quite methodical and procedural and you have this narration so you really get in to the side of his head as well and so I liked it and there there are some surprisingly comedic moments in there I know that it may not be for everyone because it is methodical slow paced slightly but I, I think that's what gives it a really good perspective. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you say, oh gosh, I don't know, I'm, I'm blank on the director, David Fincher, uh, and I'm there uh, ever since Social Network. And it was funny, okay. I, I, read, I, I read, I don't know if this was on Twitter slash X or threads or wherever, but somebody joked that the killer is David Fincher apologizing for the social network or something like that <laughs> i still haven't seen the social network oh you gotta you gotta <laughs> yeah, see so this one reminds me of seven so you have that element but also zodiac so if you liked those style of his films then i think you will probably appreciate the killer as well so then i you're bringing up those movies so i've got to ask <laughs> Is it always raining in this movie? No. Because I watched Seven recently and Zodiac recently. Yeah. Or not not Zodiac recently. It was Seven. There I is there is a rainy scene. There is a okay. rainy scene. Okay. Yeah. Because so it, a signature. It, it's a signature element of his. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um it's a bit it's like, like the it's a bit like the film director Javier Dolon, so the French Canadian film director, and he has had some TV series now that were actually at Sundance, and one of his signature elements in films is quite often rain and washing outside and various other things as well. Yeah, I'm excited for that. I hope that the killer. I can't wait for that. I. Netflix has a really nice November slate. I forget what else is coming out off the top of my mind, but I know it's, I know Nyad's another one and Rustin and a lot of those movies. Oh, yes, yes. Nyad, I missed at the festival. I think there will be opportunities to watch those. Those two Netflix films, their award strategy has been interesting, their film festival strategy, because Rustin showed up at New Fests, but there's there were a few other festivals happening at the end of the month that it didn't show up at. Right. And, 
and it's showing up at AFI Fest. And yeah, it's weird. You just have to hunt down where it, it, it's playing. But but yeah, I'm looking forward to those two. I'm looking forward to the killer. Everything you've mentioned, I'm pretty much looking forward to, but with reservation on the holdovers. I don't know what it is. I think right. it's I think I'm reminded of I'm thinking of ending things with the holdovers. And oh, I, I didn't liked, see that one. I liked that movie, yes. but I, I don't know. There's some there's something in the back of my mind with that movie where I was like, I don't know what it is, but once I see it, I can never unsee it. And I'd never seen a Charlie Kaufman film. And I don't think I've seen an Alexander Payne film. So that might be it. Okay. So you didn't see Sideways or? No. Um, uh, there's That's on the long list of movies I have never seen. The yeah. 10, 20,000 li- list um, of, of movies I've never seen. But continu- continuing with selections, um, I know you talked about Earth Mama uh, earlier. Did you see that here? Yes, at London Film Festivals. I think that one was actually in one of the awards sections. Yes, for a first feature competition. Yeah, it's very impressive as a debut and also starred Booking Woodbine as well. And I think Erica Alexander, I believe. Yes. So both of those as well were in it. And yes, this portrayal of how various social systems interact with single mothers either in their favour or against them and just beautifully shot as well. The cinematography is just so mesmerising. And yes, I think that's definitely one I will rewatch. It's a good one to see. Yeah, I was actually thinking of renting that this weekend, but I was like, something's telling me some something about that movie. I, I, I don't know why I have these weird hangups about movies when I'm like <laughs> selecting from a wide berth, like doing a lot of catch up on like movies, especially a 24 movies where I'm like, I don't know, I might not like that. Maybe I need to wait right. for the Spirit Awards. But yeah, I was looking at that this weekend. And I was thinking maybe I should watch this. And <laughs> I, I probably should have because then I, I could have said something about it. But yeah, I know I wanted to catch that during Sundance. But I just didn't get the chance to uh, go to Sundance. Uh, yes, no, Sundance I covered virtually this year. Um, yeah, uh, I did that in 2021 for yes. Coda and stuff like that. Yeah, I'll probably... Yes, I think there were a few films from Sundance that were in London Film Festival. And whilst they didn't watch them again, they are ones that I would actually like to mention. So there is yeah, Girl. Sure. Go ahead. So Girl was one of them, which is really good. I think first time feature as well, the mother and daughter and their bond. Also just hints of background trauma as well. Compelling to watch and set in Scotland. And another one is Slow, which is a Lithuanian film. And yeah, yeah, that one covered an element to relationships that isn't always explored in films. It looks at... A couple in love, but what happens when one of them is asexual? And oh, interesting. Impacts that has on the relationship. Yeah, and it's done really well. You have quite a lot of close-ups, but it's also filmed in documentary style. So some of the footage is quite grainy as well. And one of them is a dancer, and other ones like a sign language interpreter. So you then also delve into various methods of communication and how we use language and body language and how that also just um, comes into effect in relationships and all of our human interactions. And it's just really well done and captivating. And it's, yeah, it's a really good film. I definitely recommend a lot of people, if you haven't watched it, check that one out. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. I think they submitted for Oscar. I think they submitted best uh, foreign language for that film. Maybe I might be wrong on that. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm not. Yes, I'm not sure, but I think there's still time for places to change their mind in terms of which films they're looking to submit. But there's but still yes. time for Anatomy of a Fall to get in. 
I oh, still haven't um, seen that one. That one was not at the London Film Festival, so it is still on my list to watch. Neither have I um, seen Anatomy of a Fall. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. We, we're seeing a lot of docudramas um, pop up this year. It seems to be, like, the theme. I, I know, especially when I went to Slam Dance uh, virtually this year, I was like, there's a lot of docudramas this year. Yes, so one one that I will mention as well from the festival, I didn't watch it this time as I had covered it already in another festival, and that's the Chasing Amy documentary. So it's a film about the director's interest in Chasing Amy, which was quite pivotal to their life at a time when they were seeking answers but also I think had been subject to bullying and harassment and the film provided like a lifeblood for them and so the film at first starts out as like this fan service but then as the director then speaks with Kevin Smith and various other cast and crew members and discovers that there are problematic elements as well to the film and it's really well filmed so that the narrative of the documentary changes part way through and what is really quite fascinating is that the director doesn't edit any of this so there are various moments that are really quite insightful and eye-opening and you see the director themselves actually growing and developing as a result of that experience and so it's yes it's a, it's a fascinating watch i think something similar movie that deployed that i think was at tribeca break the game it was about this twitch speedrunner who was trying to speedrun Breath of the Wild, the newest Zelda game of that time, and it chronicles her like personal life. And it, like this movie it, that you're mentioning, it has that narrative shift. Yeah. And while wow, this one's Break the Game's much more edited because there's all these kinds of animations where everything's eight bit and everything like that, it it does. I I do those mo- kind of movies. I don't know if I'll be able to catch Chasing Amy though. I don't think that was virtual at Tallgrass, but it was one of the films that played there. Oh, okay. Yes, it might still come up in other festivals or out. Um, yeah, it might be towards towards season that um, we'll see some of those films as well. Um, yeah, because I sure. think it seems to be. Yes, I think it does seem to be receiving some really good. Um, press generally so I'd imagine that's coming out because yeah so I saw it at Epica yeah yeah I hope somebody like Kino Lorber or one of those other documentary houses picks it up preferably not a streaming service unless it's movie because movie Mm, does like a whole big thing when they release a movie which I've been recommending to to anyone I interview just do if you if movies at the festival talk to them, uh, I'm sure <laughs> yes, because I think say... they have a good they have a good process where they have this streaming window after they've had their cinema release, and they encourage their subscribers with movie go to go and watch the films in the cinema and provide them with discounted tickets. And yeah, so I think they they have a good model there. Yeah. Because the thing I worry about with Netflix documentaries, because I've reviewed a few of them, and people will say, oh, I didn't realize that came out. And I'm like, oh, it came out. Here's my review from when it came out. But yeah, I know they picked up Black Barbie a few weeks ago after it's tall grass. Oh, um, I, yes, I missed that one. I think it was at, oh, which festival was it? Might have been Tribeca. at Black Star. Yeah, maybe Black Star Film Festival as well. Okay, yeah, probably. Um, yeah, I missed that one because I don't think they were showing it virtually. But with that said, I know you said you didn't hate any movies. 
But what yes. I'm curious, what <laughs> which movies I, I believe you used the term tested your patience. <laughs> Indeed. Because I've had those movies, even ones I'm not reviewing. Um he's my not oh what was the remake the netflix remake that came out last year oh it was like of a popular 90s movie i he's the man or something like that it was something like that okay it was a remake of a 1990s movie and i slammed my laptop shut three different times (laughs) while watching that movie what were those kind of movies for you at london film festival yes so i think certainly Allen's were and that was just because it demanded so much patience the premise sounded really fascinating it was about the first town in California that was founded and governed by African Americans and it was the director's chronicle across a year of this particular town but the method used to show this year was one with each scene depicting a particular month and that was extremely slow moving without a lot of activity. So okay. whilst the history is probably really good and I would probably conduct more research about it, I think for me I would have liked to have seen a bit more about the former activities um, because at the moment filming it as it was and it's a disused town didn't really provide me with too much insight you can see the buildings you can see that there was some infrastructure but you didn't know how communities life was like and I would have liked a bit more I wasn't one, but it certainly test the patience of quite a few of us. Yeah, I think that was me with my feelings on the league at Tribeca. It was perfectly fine, but I don't think it I don't think it really did a whole lot for people who maybe didn't know about the Negro Leagues or and I'm not saying a documentary has to do like all the legwork for you, but the it didn't do the critical thing for me where I think, I, I don't know if you have the same thing, but you, if the documentary isn't the comprehensive thing, I at least want the movie to end with, hey, here's like a jumping off point for your own research. And it didn't do that, which I'm noticing more and more recently is here's 30% of the story, but we're not even going to give you a thrust for, hey, learn more. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I think at least if there was at the end credits a, a summary of what life had been, I think there was there were some historical photos and I think a reference to sign a, a catalogue of which locations some of the buildings were within, but it wasn't substantive enough. It could have just been like looking for a photo album and seeing some annotation in terms of place locations and that's about it and maybe reference to a few people and that was it. So I think I needed a bit more from that yeah, one. It just, it just has to create the curiosity. Like it doesn't even have to be like, hey, here's a website you can go to learn the rest. Even if it's just like, a, oh, they ended that story quickly. I wonder what happened with that. Even just something like that is something I don't think we're seeing a lot of. Yeah, but, I think there needs to be that hook. So yeah. I think with this film, the hook is probably bewilderment for a lot of people, just wondering how the images interrelate and what the subject matter is. and how they can then go and conduct their own research. I suspect there are archives, but there wasn't really a a reference of too much of that information. So I think that would have helped a bit anyway. And yeah, another one that didn't resonate with me too much was Faux, starring 
C.S.C. Ronan and Paul Mescal and Aaron Pierre from Brava, which, yeah, Brava was at last year's London Film Festival and has just had a cinematic release fairly recently. So he was in that one as well. But yes, that one, that film, I think it's, I think it's premise had potential and I could see it doing really well on a theatre stage or in literature, but I just found it to be lacking. It didn't compel me. The performances were actually quite good, irrespective of that, but there wasn't enough to draw me into the storyline and so I just found it was quite slow but meandering and just not so compelling yeah I made a joke in our chat our group chat for the IFSC was like you just know prime Amazon prime video or I'm sorry they want us to call it prime video I keep flipping up (laughs) <laughs> uh, in fact, I've seen some pretty big blunders by some places like Collider still calling it Amazon Video. But I joked that this is going to be the opportunity where Amazon Studios is going to say, oh, it was the most rewound movie to <laughs> give it that panache of, oh, I sh- to regular people who maybe they don't watch it. These. <laughs> yeah, to go watch it. Like, oh, why yeah. it was the most rewound? We all know. <laughs> but yeah, jokes aside, I feel bad for these kinds of movies where the execution isn't there, but everything else is. Especially with big... Uh, Paul Mescal isn't really a big name. He's getting there because he was in another film in the festival as well, which is... It has the emotion that foe is lacking. So that's all of us strangers. and. Yeah. That's one that a lot of people talk about in the festival and is poetically filmed. It's beautiful. It's non-linear, but it still grips you in its storyline as it delves into grief, memory, loneliness. There's just so much to that film and really good performances as well with Andrew Scott and Paul Mescal and... Claire Foy as well. Uh, I I say to people, make sure you have some tissues handy. It is a tearjerker and it's definitely one that will linger in the mind for many days after watching it. Hmm. All right. Because you said two things that turn me off is non-linear. Right. And then, oh, actually, just basically that one is like a big, ooh, I don't know about this. <laughs> But I don't know. It seems to have worked really well recently. I can't remember a time recently where it hasn't worked. And I'll watch anything Paul Mescal's in, if I'm going to be honest. After Sun, he's got me. He's got me as a fan. So if he shows up in the uh, in, in a bad movie, I'll probably see it anyways. Yeah, that one's not a bad. That one's no. Not a bad I'm not film. saying. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying all of the stranger is. Yes. But yeah, I'm super interested in that one. Maybe seeing that, maybe that gets double screened with not the bike rider. What's the other searchlight movie we were just talking about? Four things. Maybe that's a double screen. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That would be an interesting one. Yeah. Yes. They did that yeah. with uh, last year with Empire of Light and Banshees. So I feel like we've got a similar kind of double screener situation uh, <laughs> okay. going up. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, there are many more that I watched that I can probably mention. So there yeah, was one ahead. called there was one called The Bride, another one, a first time feature director, female director as well. And this one covers a perspective of Rwanda that we're perhaps not accustomed to seeing within film. So this one set in the 90s and touches upon spates of kidnappings that used to happen. So young girls would literally be kidnapped from the side of the street whilst they may be walking on their way home or to school and then were married off. And their families were then powerless to do anything. So it highlights the patriarchy, how the institution was at the time, 
And then also within this, there's that thwarted ambition too, because if this young girl's married off, then she's not necessarily going to be educated anymore. So there's a lot of that. But within this as well, there's also a burgeoning friendship that also develops, which is really quite good to see. And then seeing how the young girl builds her identity as well and still manages to hold on to her aspirations too. So that's that was a really good one as well. And another one, there was a cult the one. Distributing? I don't know if it has one yet. Um, okay. I'll look it up later. Yeah. Director is Miriam Ferrari. Yeah. I'm not sure if that one got picked up. But yeah, that's quite a good one. Another one as well was Late Night with the Devil, which is an Australian film covering found footage concept. And you have a you have TV footage found like 40 years later after a tv show went haywire it was a halloween special and so you then get to delve into the behind the scenes of that particular episode of late night television and so it takes you into that framework of how late night television operated and how it was this blend of sensationalization but also having some really quite profound subject matter on there and how the studio themselves worked to try and gauge their audience and build their audience figures as well and it's a good one to watch it's taught it's well done covers elements better than some of the cinema it's a good one to watch I'll uh, put that on my list because that sounds right up my alley. <laughs> Late night and a cult. Yes, please. That's a perfect horror movie. Yes, that's that was a good one to watch. Um, just with a slightly different genre and theme because there were some quite profound, heavy films at the film festival this year. So one as well that was quite heavy that I'm sure you'll hear about is a zone of interest so yes uh, jonathan glazer's film yeah yeah i talked about it with thomas stone judge on our tiff podcast that's one of our like featured image things for the podcast is as an in joke when i was making the images because we talked about how at the press screenings they had double build and anatomy of a fall and zone of interest together so for the podcast images, I used for the for, for the Patreon image, I used Anatomy of a Fall, and then the second one for the public was a Zone of Interest. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we talked about that qu- quite a bit. Love that poster, by the way. That is amazing. Yeah. So with that one, I mean, I watched it at the public screening. So the director was there, and some of the crew as well. So it was quite good to hear an introduction with him about the film and I had been forewarned that it was one that would definitely linger in the mind for several days after just in terms of the abject horror within it um, that it depicts and there is a sense that it's quite timely given that it covers wartime and the atrocities and at the moment we are seeing within news reports atrocities occurring daily at the moment so I think it is it is one that I think a lot of people will actually watch and then just understand the sensitivities and and it is it is filmed sensitively, but it doesn't distract from the horror. Good, because I feel like there's a version of that movie where I think you could sensationalize things. Because I've watched some of those movies, a lot of them actually being A24 movies. But yeah, I, I'm really interested in seeing that. Maybe I'll do my own Anatomy of a Fall, Zone of Interest, double feature, whenever that comes out. 
It may be one just to watch by itself, I think, or watch it as the latter of the two, because it's one that you certainly need time to digest afterwards or do as I did and go to a reception afterwards. So they did have a reception after the film. So that was actually a good way to offset it because whilst the horror isn't on screen, it's in the background, but it doesn't shy away from that depiction. Yeah, good to know. Maybe I'll do just, that's the only thing I've got for the day, just. <laughs> yes. Because I tell you what, exiting Oppenheimer and then trying to process those emotions in 30 minutes and then going to Barbie, I was like, okay. Uh, I, I recommend it to people to do it the other way around. Go to I, Barbie first. <laughs> I just didn't want to do the thing where you go in into the one movie super happy and then immediately follow up with depressing. Um, and then you're leaving the movie theater and you're like, oh, I'm depressed. Um, <laughs> but at least if you watch it in the evening, then <laughs> you just have to go home and have something to eat and go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Give you time to process it all. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and a couple of films that I wanted to mention, I watched quite early on as pre-festival films. So we had the new Corriere film, Monster, which is it's such a beautiful film. It's poignant, but it's beautiful and depicts, she also looks at Othering as well. And yes, I don't want to say too much more, but... It's a really affecting film. So, yes, I was glad to watch that one as well. And then there was the new Michelle Franco film, Memory, which stars Jessica Chastain and Peter Sarsgaard in that one. And I'd say it's probably an accessible film by Franco standards. So certainly not as nihilistic as some of his others. Last year, I think we had a sundown, I think, that he had with it's Tim up. Roth. Yes, with Tim Roth. Yeah, so that one still wasn't as nihilistic as some of his others, like New Order. But I'd say memory is fairly palatable to watch, and Jessica Chastain is always good. So that was it. So those two are quite good to watch as well. Yeah, so I watched quite a few <laughs> films in that. Oh, another one, actually, that was that quite surprised me. It was a French film called The Animal Kingdom. And that one's directed by Thomas Kelly. And it stars Roman Dury. And most of the time, if there's a film with Roman Dury in it, I will go to watch it. And I was really pleasantly surprised by this one. It has so much heart in it. So it's a tale of man versus nature and also looks at othering and a father-son relationship and family bonds, but also friendship and coming of age. And it's just really sensitively handled as well um, and just leaves you with a feeling of having been charmed by a film even though some of it is um yeah quite touching but that one was yeah that one was a good surprise actually to watch it was in the frill strand of the festival so that one was quite good yeah and we mentioned fingernails and fingernails I, I did really like as well so as Christos Nikou's second film after Apples and his English language debut Starring Jesse Buckley and Riz Ahmed and Jeremy Allen White from The Bear. And there's just fantastic chemistry in it. It's, just, it's a unique take on testing love and has a slight sci-fi element to it all as it's set in a new near future. But you have really good performances and it's quite captivating and mesmerizing and also has a lot of heart to it as well. And then, yeah, it's just the dynamics between 
Riz and Jesse. It's just so mesmerizing watching them as well. And it's really good. And it's out soon. Yeah, real soon. It's <laughs> yes. A week, two weeks. So, um, yes. Uh, but with that said, were there any films that you just didn't get to? Yes, there were a few that I didn't manage to watch. And yes, one of them was The Hitman, said a new Richard Linklater film. I've heard so many people just giving this a lot of praise. And so it's on my list to watch. So hopefully I will get to see that one soon as well. Another one I just couldn't make it to if the timetabling was May, December. And yeah, that one with Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman, I heard, is also meant to be really quite good, really good performances from the two of them. So that was one also on my list. So I hope to get to see that. And the Book of Clarence. Yes, I couldn't get to see that one either with the timetabling, but yes. That one's high on the list too to see. Yeah, I think those are also on my list. I I think those all uh, those are all the next two months. It's crazy and, and it's weird. I think did we hear about Book of Clarence just like a week ago, or was that like known about for a while? I think there might have been some discussion about it before, but. I don't think it has been heavily marketed. So maybe perhaps more people will go to see it because I did see people actually coming from that screening before I was going to watch one film and it certainly had a really good turnout. So I think it will be one that's eagerly anticipated by many. Yes. Yeah. I did watch um I did watch the French film Les Undesirables as well, which is the second feature by Lajli, who did Les Miserables. And that one, yeah, so that one was quite good. Just looking at life in a Parisian suburb and the tensions between the community and the authorities, where there's a newly appointed mayor, and so he's trying to prove himself and then ends up being um, with some of the community activists. And so the film does really well in ratcheting up that tension and having the world building in there and just having that constant sense of dread that something terrible is going to happen. And so it definitely keeps the audience just compelled and riveted and has some really good performances in that too i'll make sure to put those on my list i you get you give me like a longer list than i thought i'd have going into this <laughs> although some of them were already on my list like salt burn yes and then i guess going into next year for 2024 do you have any suggestions to anyone who might want to go next year to london film festival Oh, yes. I would definitely recommend coming if you are a first time visitor and haven't done so beforehand. And one thing that's really good is the community. So I would certainly suggest trying to contact people on social media. There is a hashtag for the festival. It's usually just LFF. And you can then get in contact with people. And there's usually before the surprise film, some drinks as well. So a lot of people meet together for that. And don't be afraid to just say hello to people. So you might have seen their pictures on social media and you can just say hello. Or if there's somebody that you recognize, you can just speak to them in the queue. And most people are friendly and will help you out as well one tip that I would actually provide is don't necessarily feel that you have to buy tickets for the festival so a lot of people do that because there are tickets that will go on sale um, for the public 
sometimes before the press schedules are announced. So if you've applied for press accreditation or industry accreditation, then you shouldn't need to buy tickets unless you want to watch the surprise film. With your press or industry pass, you will also have the possibility to attend some public screenings if there is availability. And then there are also ballot opportunities as well to see public screenings and sometimes discount codes too. So most of the times you'll get to see the majority of the films that you want to. And then also you can just go and watch random films or join a queue or at late minute. There's the last minute delegates queue as well. So if cinemas have spare tickets, then you can also get in to watch certain films. So I did that this year. I went and I ended up watching the um, French film Dali, <laughs> as it's known. And it's about the surrealist painter Salvador Dali. It's Quentin Dupio. And again, it stars Roman, Roman Dury as well. So that was quite good. And it also had Gilles Lelouch to and yes and was a surreal film and I I didn't know what it was about at all I just had quite a large gap between films and so I thought I'd go and try to see if I could fit in one more before an evening film so festival best yeah. good to try and pace your films and pace the times and you don't have to review every film that that would don't. be another tip and even if you feel like you have to I'd also recommend if you feel like you have to just try writing it first because there have been situations where I've tried to write a festival review and I'm like, I can sum this up in a tweet <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and or maybe just do something like a short review, capsule reviews. I know for short programs, I usually bundle all those shorts together in one review oh yes absolutely yes there's yeah. lots of ways to do it so quite a lot of us will have a thread with just summaries of the films that we've watched once the embargoes have passed and so that's one way to do it and then you can write longer form reviews for various other films too so i say definitely pace yourself and there are also some really quite experienced film festival attendees who have actually written quite helpful guides in terms of what to expect from the film festival and strategies are good to employ if it is your first time or second time some of those are quite good to locate as well and if anything contact me or contact some of the others um, who on social media such as twitter x whichever its name is at the moment Why? <laughs> uh, but yeah yeah and i'll just say for the review embargoes i know i ran in this a lot with tribeca don't post it as soon as the embargo hits because sometimes you're dealing with a review embargo that hits at 11 o'clock at night don't post your review at 11 o'clock at night no, nobody's reading a review at 11 o'clock at night no who does that but anyways <laughs> <laughs> don't follow it to the letter of the law. Whenever you see it and the review embargoes past, review it then. Don't wait till 11 o'clock until just wait till the next day at that point. It, it can wait another few hours. Yes, because some of those embargoes did um, finish quite late, meaning or if the film had was a world premiere and or else 30 minutes in. So if you've got a film that started at nine o'clock, then you do have to take that into account as to when you can publish your review as well. Yeah, with that, Latoya, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, first, before I get into the whole outro spiel, where can people follow you on social media? Yes, you can find me on Twitter. And my handle is... Frangle27, spelled F-R-A-N-G-L-A-I-S, number 27, which is the same handle on Instagram as well. And I have my website, which is Frangle27Tales. And so I'm on there and I'm on Rotten Tomatoes as well. Places people can find me. 
Yeah, and you can find me on social media at Austin B Media on Blue Sky, Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon, Pebble, <laughs> or Pebble and Threads on, but on Twitter slash X, I'm on there at Austin B Media underscore because their username policy on Twitter is atrocious. I can't even contact Twitter help anymore about this, but I've talked a lot about this in the past. It's a thing. Like if you go at twitter.com slash Austin B Media, it says this account doesn't exist. But then when I try to change my username to that, it says, oh, this username's taken. Which is it? But, and if you fancy the letterbox, I'm on there at Austin B Movies. But with that said, thank you for listening or watching, depending on where you're, if you're watching this on Spotify, I think you can only watch it on Spotify. It's really weird. But on Apple Podcasts, you can listen to it. I think Spotify, you can probably listen as well. Yeah, you have to set it up, though. It's like a setting where you have to force okay. it to do audio only because I upload these as videos and it's, it prefers a video. So it, I don't know. It's weird. Spotify is weird with this. <laughs> but yeah, whichever way, if you listened or watched, thank you for doing whichever one. I have been your host, Austin Belzer. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe. But yeah, that's the podcast episode. Thank you so much. And to my listeners slash watchers, until next time. <laughs> <laughs>